Howdy, welcome to A Man's Take podcast number two. I'm James Kleinick here with Springs in the Desert, and today we have a wonderful talk for y'all. I got to visit with Edward Lursman, who is a licensed professional counselor with Spirit of Peace Clinical Counseling. They're based out of Columbus, Ohio, and Edward himself actually does some of his in-person work through St. Catherine of Siena and Bexley, Our Lady of Perpetual Help in Grove City, and St. Paul the Apostle in Westerville. So if you're in the area and you want to talk to this guy, you can do that. And then if you're also in broader Ohio, if you're dealing with COVID, you don't want to get out, that's fine too. He does telehealth all throughout the state. Uh, his contact information is going to be in the show notes. So go there, check it out. We also have a link to his clin clinical practice as well. We had an awesome talk. Uh, we got to hit from a lot of topics, including dealing with grief, interacting with your wife, trying to grow with her, the benefits of counseling potentially to a marriage that's dealing with loss of infertility or dealing with a miscarriage. And then at the very end of it, we got to talk even a little bit about how you might be able to interact with other people who have undergone artificial reproductive technologies that are illicit in the eyes of the church. So. There's a lot of really great content here. We think you guys are going to love it. Uh, we have some other resources also listed in the show notes, so go check that out if you want some more books on different topics here or to learn a little bit more about counseling and how it could benefit your marriage. Thanks for being here. Enjoy the talk. Howdy, everybody. I want to welcome you back to A Man's Take. I'm James Kleinick. I'm here today with Edward Lursman, who's going to be joining us for a really interesting discussion on infertility and loss, what it means to be a man and deal with uh, these sorts of difficulties. Uh, really grateful for you being here today, Edward. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, James. Yeah, well, would you like to just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us about your credentials and your practice. Yeah, so I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Ohio. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty new professional in that um, it's not been that far out since I graduated from my master's program in Ohio State, but during my grad program and kind of in launching into my career, I really wanted to make a focus on infertility and miscarriage, doing that research in grad school, and then really kind of launching into that in my career. So um, that's kind of my, my credentials dealing with other mental um, health issues as well. Um, the whole smattering, but that's, that's kind of where I want to really focus in my career as a population I'm very passionate about. So That's great. And just out of curiosity, did you find people uh, around? Which, which university did you attend in Ohio? Oh, yeah, I guess I should say that. I went to uh, the Ohio State University in Columbus. That's wonderful. Down, I, I'm, from, I'm from Texas, right? So when we hear OSU down here, I'm thinking Oklahoma State. Uh, yeah. It was a little bit... It's the other OSU that you're from up there. That's so, right. <laughs> with a much stronger football program, as it turns out. I hope I don't offend some Cowboys down here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I was, uh, so I went to school down at UT, and uh, yeah, the first few years that we were down there was always a really heated, heated set of, uh, we were playing OSU, Ohio State, a couple times. We had some mm -hmm. football games against y'all. Uh, Anyway, it was yeah. always a lot of fun to watch those games. Yeah, I remember some of those games with <laughs> Texas back in the day. I do. <laughs> and I do, too. That was the year we won the national championship. So uh, it went yeah. much better for us than you, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were at OSU doing some of, your, uh, some of your master's work, were you working with any particular prof uh, professor or anybody specifically that was dealing with infertility uh, with men that kind of led you in that direction? Or what, what was it that took you in that path? Yeah, so it, it wasn't necessarily that there were um, instructors or uh, researchers at the university that had that focus, but kind of more of my personal uh, convictions. Uh, I think in large part because just kind of having my eyes open and seeing how frequently I was seeing this kind of issue, the miscarriage and also infertility as well, happening around me, you know, in my personal life. Um, but just seeing truly how many people that impact and that kind of started my interest. And so uh, during the start of uh, my second year in my program, when I had an invitation to do a 
group project, a group counseling project. I chose, and you could choose whatever topic you wanted. I chose at that time miscarriage and the male experience of miscarriage. And that kind of started my academic professional launch into the topic of miscarriage first, but then it expanded further into infertility once I realized how interconnected those two themes are, those two experiences can be at t- for some people. So that's kind of where it started and seeing the perspective with miscarriage and then started researching about the male experience of infertility. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. It, it, dealing with either infertility or miscarriage, it, it really does seem like from, well, so my, my experience with infertility has been that it's been a, you know, it's a natural grieving to come to grips with the fact that, all right, well, I may not be able to, to have biological children like most people are kind of led to believe on the front end of things. Um, so it's really interesting that you were able to hone in on uh, the similarities between uh, dealing with a miscarriage and dealing with infertility. Um, have, you, have you found in your practice that there seems to be a lot of similarity in the way that you're dealing with patients who are, who are um, I guess, working their way through either the experience of infertility or, or dealing with the loss of, uh, mm-hmm. of a preborn child. Yeah, there, there's a similar theme with that loss, with what the, the couple or the man or the woman are experiencing, which is there's a, there's a unique quality to it. It's a, it's a, um, a perspective loss. So rather than grieving someone that passed away, like say, you know, um, an aunt or an uncle or someone in your family that you have this long standing relationship with and all these memories, a lot of times you're grieving the relationship retrospectively. Mm-hmm. Like you, you lost the, the relationship as it was to you and kind of continuing it. There, there's a prospective aspect of infertility and miscarriage because you're mourning a loss of a future, a reality that did not come to be. So yeah. it's, a, it's a different quality that, and, and that seems a theme there is mourning, you know, having that child, if it's a miscarriage, a specific child as part of your, in your life, maybe the future you dreamt of having with that child, or if it's infertility, children that you have not conceived and maybe imagined would be in your life at this point in your life. So that's kind of a, a really strong theme that I've found um, in that. Yeah, that's really interesting to think about too. I, dealing with, you know, there's, there's obviously different levels of reality that you're functioning with there. On, on one hand, you know, when you have an individual or, or a couple really, we're talking really Catholic couples here. Well, I mean, Christian couple, couples in general, right? But generally speaking, we're talking about married couples that are dealing with infertility. In those instances, yeah, a lot of what they're kind of confronted with is this, this possibility of a future that's not really, a, that, that may or may not be a possibility, um, you know, still. They're, maybe the odds are now just much smaller than whatever they thought originally it would be going into, a, into a, their marriage. Uh, whereas, I guess, if you're dealing with the loss of a of a child in a, in a situation where, um, you no longer, well, yeah, dealing with, dealing with the loss of a child, just it being actually the loss of a child, you're not really talking about the same, uh, lack of possibility that you might otherwise be struggling with, uh, from an infertility standpoint. Um, yeah, I, I can see that being very nuancy in terms of how you might deal with one couple versus another, but I could also see, mm-hmm. um, at least from the male experience of that or from the individual experience of that, there being some, some definite similarities in terms of a sense of what you thought you were going to have versus what you wound up with. Yeah, yeah. And as we're talking, I want to make sure that I emphasize that as, if I talk about themes, if I talk about trends, that may or may not apply to individuals or to individual couples. You know, there may be different experiences with this, but as we're talking as a whole, there tends to be some cogent, you know, some themes that we're, that we're seeing here. So, and you rightly point out that um, a couple with infertility may or may not in a given time experience hopelessness or maybe have a little bit more hope. 
So it's not always a constant trend of a loss where maybe they feel the loss more sometimes than others. So I, I like that point that you were making, that it's nuanced. Yeah. I, the more you look at any of these situations, it, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you kind of differentiate between dealing with trends versus dealing with individuals. And I'm sure as a, as a, as a licensed professional, you're, you're probably very much in both of those worlds. And I'm, I'm sure not every solution works for everybody. Not every, not every mentality perfectly encapsulates every individual. Uh, it, it's got to make for a really dynamic environment with what, with what it is that you work in. Absolutely. And that can be applied to counseling in general. You, you can learn the theories, you can learn the interventions, um, but how it's applied for each individual, each couple is very different. So you kind of have to have this ongoing flexibility to just kind of meet the person where they're at, which kind of is how relationships work in general too. So, oh, you that know. Is truth. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about grief. I think this is kind of a, a natural segue at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested. So this is, this is a man's take. We're kind of talking about what it's like to be a man experiencing some of the things mm -hmm. that, uh, dealing with infertility specifically. Have you clinically been able to, uh, I imagine clinically you've been able to see that there is a difference between the way that men and women process grief. Uh, what is it that you find as a constant sort of maybe a pattern uh, that might be relatable to others about that male experience dealing with, uh, we could talk about either infertility or losing a child um, as we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the male experience of loss there and studies have kind of looked into this as well. So, I mean, I'll, I kind of talk anecdotally, but also I'm kind of tapping into the research as well. Men often are more likely to be less open, to grieve less openly and talk less about their grief, about their loss. Um, that's, that's a pretty, pretty consistent theme across the board when it comes to grief and loss, not just with infertility and miscarriage, but also in terms of the broader sense of, of grief. But that, that's definitely a, a difference between in men and women. Women tend to, again, trend tend to be more likely to open up and seek out some sort of social support in that they, they are more likely to talk about it, whether it's with their husband, whether it's with uh, a sister, you know, sisters in the Lord, uh, whomever, but are more likely to open up and seek that out. Men are less likely to seek that kind of support out. Again, that's not to say that there aren't men who appreciate that and would seek that out, but as a trend, men tend to uh, be a little bit more silent about, about their grief. Yeah, that is actually something that I thought is really interesting. I'll, I'll hit on this kind of briefly. Uh, so over the past year or two, I've kind of become something of a fan of Jordan Peterson, listening to the things that he has to say. He's kind of opened up a whole different realm of psychology that I, you know, wouldn't have been. I'm, I'm trained as a structural engineer, okay? So that's, I'm a math and science guy. I like literature. I like some of these other things, but my, my thinking is more kind of tuned in specifically on the engineering side of things. Um, but one of the things that he, uh, that Peterson has pointed out that I think is interesting is that it sounds like there's kind of these bell curves, more or less, in terms of how men interact with the world and women interact in the world. And you can plot that onto, you know, whether or not you're agreeable or whether or not you're analytical or, you know, there's all these different sorts of spheres that aren't, it isn't like all men are analytical and are, you know, all women are agreeable. It's like there's all these different, you know, there, there's a lot of different metrics and a lot of different realms in which these mm. things. You kind of got these bell curves that overlap kind of in the middle so that, you know, there's, you might say that 80% of the population kind of still possesses a lot of these qualities, but as you get out to the extremes, it's more men than you find women kind of as things kind of taper off. Um, so it seems like, it seems like even with grief or with other things, there's still a lot of similarities that men and women would possess in the way that they deal with things. But really, as mm -hmm. you, uh, there's a greater chance though, at least that as you move towards the extremes of these personality traits, like whether or not I'm open or closed, maybe to, uh, to the way that I'm processing my emotions, 
you probably find more men on the extreme of that that are tend to be more quiet than you find women being quiet about dealing with grief, I suppose. Is that is that something that's that's true here also? Yeah, yeah. Or if you were another way to put it too is if you were to have two bell curves on the same axis and and you would chart it out, the, the male curve would be uh, lower on the end of the, the social um, axis than the women's. So yeah, you're right in the sense that there is that trend that men tend to be on the lower side and then women tend to be on the higher side for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and working with men specifically, so we'll, we'll depart a little bit from the academics and get more into uh, perhaps the, the everyday interactions uh, in some of your clinical practice. You know, what, if, what's in, what would you say is important for, a, for men to bear in mind as they're dealing with these, these, this sense of grief, especially if they feel a greater disposition towards uh, isolation, perhaps, in, in the midst mm -hmm. of learning about um, their infertility? Yeah. Yeah. So grief is real and it can be a very powerful experience for both men and women. And so even though men are less likely to express it externally, it does not mean it's any less powerful of an experience internally uh, for them. Um, I know that there's been research done um, specifically on the experience of grief through um, miscarriage, through perinatal grief. And they found that men have a similar level of grief in, when measured on a scale as to women. It's really? a little different. Than, yes. Really? It's, yeah. It's, wow, that's amazing. I would have not have. I would have not figured that. Yeah. Yeah. Now there there seems to be a difference in terms of duration of the grief. Okay. But in, but in terms of the intensity, um, particularly at the beginning, um, statistically, it was basically the same. And I would expect that men perhaps don't deal with the with the grief perhaps as long as women on, on, on like the, you know, when you take a look at averages. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I use that just because I know we're talking more about infertility, but there's less research about infertility. And to my knowledge, it's not, I don't know if there's even a scale that measures um, the distress caused by infertility. There may be, but I'm not aware of it. But I know just kind of as a, as, you know, relating to the miscarriage, which I'm sure there's the similarities there that I, if I had to make a, an educated guess, the um, level of distress and grief with infertility would be also similar between men and women. So That's interesting. Is there, is there, is there a reason that you think that there may not be as much focus or enough, as much research, I should say, into kind of the infertility experience as what you find with miscarriage? That is a good question. And I'm shooting off the hip here because <laughs> I don't have any substantial reason to know one way or the other. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm kind of, if I'm throwing you under the bus on anything, you can basically no, say, that. come on, Jim. That's okay. That's okay. I, <laughs> I, personally, I personally think that, well, both, both topics are, have an abysmal level of research. There's some research on both, but to be honest, they're bo it's both. Uh, both topics are neglected. So mm -hmm. I will say that for whatever reason, infertility does seem to even have even a little bit less than miscarriage. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why. And I, and just anecdotally, sometimes um, it also seems like there's, there's been less infertility outreach me perhaps too. Like I, I, and maybe that's just my local bias. I've, you know, yeah. I, a little bit more in the in the loss in the miscarriage world than I have in the infertility. Is that a coincidence? I'm not sure, but yeah. um, that's a great question. Well, I feel like my own personal experience with that dealing with infer like the experience of infertility with my wife, we really haven't seen as many resources available through the diocese or through our parishes. Um, then you know, there's I think that there there's oftentimes more focus on children once they become real through the experience of a, you know, a preborn child, for example, um, you see a lot of dealing with that. You don't, you don't, and I think a lot of these things are, are naturally kind of more silent. It's not as though it's as out in the open. Most people aren't running around and, and it's the same thing with miscarriage, right? No one, no one's walking mm -hmm. around like, Hey, yeah, well, we had a miscarriage this past week. It was great. Uh, you know, far from it. It's, you know, it's a traumatic experience. Um, dealing with infertility is a traumatic experience. 
Um, it takes time and it takes patience to work your way past it. And any time that you hear somebody bringing up children or otherwise, it becomes like this, especially in the front sides of it, right? You get this like dagger to the heart where you're just kind of like, Ugh. again, here we go. Um, but I, but I, I will say that, well, I, and yeah, there, there don't seem to be as many resources, which is a part of the reason why Springs in the Desert has kind of come into being as it is. Um, mm -hmm. And there doesn't seem to be as much discussion about it. So it would seem kind of natural to me that it translates over into some of the science um, yeah. or, or perhaps the lack of, of research at this point, which I also, I also kind of have wondered too, whether or not a lot of this is, is more environmental these days, whether there's, you know, I, I need to go take a look at some of the numbers a little bit because it'd be interesting to, to look at fertility rates in Africa um, as opposed to fertility rates in the United States um, or in Europe. Um, and that's a big generalization, right? There are, there are developed areas of Africa, there are uh, you know, really terrible regions of uh, Europe and the United States where things are, are not developed in, in, uh, in the same sort of a sense. But it does kind of seem just at least talking with the people around me, I tend to see or feel as though there might be more infertility today than perhaps with what my parents grew up with. Um, but that said, you know, again, it was a, a lot quieter time back then too. So I'm not quite sure as to, mm -hmm. what that is or, or, but it would, but if that is the case, it would translate kind of more uh, clearly into why we might not see as many ministries set up for this, if it's really a more contemporary problem than what it has been historically. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, whether it's an issue of increase or a level of slowly moving towards a little bit more uh, openness about the issue. That's a good question. And I just, yeah, your guess is as good as mine at this yeah. point. It might be a little bit of both. Um, yeah. Anyway, I don't know, interesting stuff. Well, let me, let me ask you this. So going back to your clinical practice, um, assuming you had somebody that came in that was dealing with, we'll say, either miscarriage or infertility, um, do you usually treat couples or are you usually dealing with individuals more frequently? What does your practice look like? So starting out, I've worked mostly with individuals, mm -hmm. um, but couples is an area that I'm now starting to wade into more. Um, recently, I did some furthering um, continued education in um, the uh, Gottman method of couples work, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Gottman Institute, but they're one of the they're one of the big names in couples counseling. Um, so if you're going to pick one of the schools of couples counseling. Gottman is one of the ones to do. So Can you briefly, um, that being philosophically, kind of talk about what what that school's about. Yeah. So. They, it's, it's not a theory. So there's different in this counseling world, there's different theories of how you look at the human person and kind of how problems have developed and how do you work on solving them and helping the person experience greater wellness and peace uh, okay. through the interventions. This isn't a theory, but it's a series of interventions and kind of a, a method of how do you, how do you do work with couples that incorporates whatever theory theoretical background you utilize but so for example they just come up with different interventions in terms of this is what you do if you to resolve a past conflict within uh, a married couple this is how you um, this is how you create rituals of connection this is how you uh, kind of establish better communication where both parties feel like they're being heard out so it's a lot of building up the marriage the marriage relationship Mm -hmm. uh, and then also helping them navigate any conflicts, any sort of okay. things that come up that, that challenge the relationship. So that being said, kind of wading into that couple's world more now, I want to really increase the amount of my practice in the couple's world, including in the infertility world. I'd love to see um, more couples, uh, in specifically in regards to grieving, infertility, or miscarriage. Yeah, right on. Right on. So with respect to that, um, what are the big things to be on the lookout? So if you're, if you're a couple that's dealing with infertility, um, you already kind of know that men and women at least tend to, on some level, process things a little bit differently. Uh, clinically speaking, what do you think as the, what are the, the considerations that those couples should be uh, bearing out and, and how can they reach out to each other? What's, what's the best way of trying to 
show that you're still working on that marriage with each other, especially through these kind of challenging, really challenging uh, problems. Yeah. Yeah. So in a couple, you have the individuals and their realities in terms of how they're experiencing the infertility and then how they as a couple are interacting and, and how that's, that whole process is affecting their relationship because inevitably it does have a, an effect on the marriage. So the first thing I'm thinking is how are the individuals coping with their sense of loss? How are they coping with this difficult situation, which, you know, sometimes infertility is described as a roller coaster of hope and despair, where sometimes you're very hopeful and sometimes you have no hope. And so that's a very difficult process to go through that month after month, just kind of an ongoing basis and kind of growing more and more um, in, in despair as time goes on. How are the individuals coping with that? In one sense, are they coping with it? You know, um, are they just um, shutting down on that? Are they escaping? Are they seeking out other ways to deal with it instead of actually addressing the grief head on? You know, that's where, um, you know, escaping, especially with men, there tends to be a, a, a tendency to escape, whether it be to the man cave, watching football, or whether it be something even like something unhealthy, like, oh, like drinking or something like that. But pornography. those are, or pornography, that's another one. But seeing those as like a symptom of not dealing with the distress at hand, which is the grief, which is the distress, the stress about it. So, yeah. So one, are they, are they dealing with the losses individually at all, period? Second of all, how are they dealing? Like, how are they dealing with it? Is there different styles? Um, one thing is that men tend to, and this is again, trends, but not, not every guy. Men tend to want to problem solve mm -hmm. more frequently. And women tend to want to talk about it more, you know? So that's kind of like, and that's almost become a cliche in some ways, but there is some truth in that, in that, the man wants to solve the problem and then sometimes the woman's like but i don't have a problem it's not that i need i want the problem to be solved but i also just want you to listen to me i just want you to hear me out like in this moment sure so so you kind of have to look at what are the different coping styles in this couple and do they are they like clashing are they are they matching um, because that affects the relationship and the dynamic and there could be some friction there if they're dealing with it in different ways. If they, if one is escaping and not talking about it, the other one might think that they're not caring. Typically it would be often the man not talking about it. The wife might think, does he not care? Does he not um, want to support me? Those kind of things. And you can see how that, that quickly goes into the couple's realm. And also now you're talking about the couple's relationship. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's interesting to think about that too. So in what you were talking about, whether or not the two, the two ways that the individuals are dealing with infertility and how they, those sometimes are not complementary. Uh, I'm kind of curious, what would that look like in a way that they might be complementary? Yes. So one thing that I think has to be happening in order for that to work if you have very different styles, very different personalities, different ways of approaching this, you know, like we said, one problem solving, one talking about it. There has to be some communication ultimately in there. There has to be communication uh, in terms of how each spouse is dealing with the difficult situation. Because if you're not having communication, then there's a lot uh, there's, you know, you take there's perceptions, you take things different ways, and then there's misunderstanding, mm. you know, so, so, um, and, th and that's not good. That's not good. So one important thing is just to have, even have communication in the first place. And it's really hard for men, you know, then have to open up on that a little bit, but it's really, because on the woman's perspective, it can be very important to at least hear some of what he's going through yeah. she understands you're suffering too you also get it you 
also like do want to support me but you're also like why are you escape or why are you removing yourself like this and so that it can be a greater empathy greater understanding between the two so that's a difficult process especially for um for men who may not be very open to talking about it sure that's important to have that communication to kind of dispel some of those miscommunications and misunderstandings yeah it's it's not a very natural thing to want to do uh, and I think that as you, I mean, it requires a certain level of vulnerability and really dealing with kind of the bare bones of something that, you know, if, if a man is more hardwired to want to run, uh, that's, that's completely the opposite direction. Uh, because if you're fleeing to comfort, this is, you know, running headlong into discomfort. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask this too, because it's kind of an interesting thing to think about since I'm talking with a counselor, uh, you know, in general, uh, do you find or what do you think the, at what point might a couple want to actually seek out counseling if they're dealing with an issue that uh, they're having some difficulty kind of working their way through? Like what, what would you recommend there? What would I recommend in terms of when they should seek counseling or, or when are they typically getting around to, to seeking it out? <laughs> Sure. I'll, I'll go with either of those. Like, what do you, yeah, your professional opinion here, you, we're in a, we're in a position where mm -hmm. uh, this couple is dealing with loss. Um, is, are there some telltale signs where they may want to go like, okay, maybe, maybe we ought to get somebody else involved with this. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would usually probably recommend for a, uh, an individual or a couple to come to counseling when they're starting to feel overwhelmed, when they're starting to feel like they're having difficulty balancing it. Uh, and usually that probably before they ultimately seek out counseling, like there's usually a gap there in terms of building up the courage or the uh, intentionality, the, um, intention to seek out counseling like there is there is some stigma there is definitely some barriers to seeking out counseling like there's a lot of connotations there's a lot of financial concerns there's a lot of there's a lot of factors that you know time management factors there's a lot of things that go on so usually when they probably should seek out counseling there probably is a delay there between when they should maybe potentially seek out support and then when they actually do but uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent naturally of, of counseling. So when, when someone's going through a difficult thing and they feel like they don't have any outlet in terms of um, specifically social support, but just feel like they feel overwhelmed, don't know how to proceed, um, or maybe feel like they don't have someone to talk to, um, I think those are ample possibilities, ample opportunities to, okay, I should think about seeking out some support. And, you know, recognizing that, you know, the, the old stigma is, you know, there has to be serious pathology to seek out counseling. Mm. Like me coming to counseling means something is seriously wrong with me. And that kind of, I, I want to, yeah. I was going to say it kind of, it's kind of like preventative maintenance as opposed to, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I should probably go get my car tires rotated before one of them blows out on the side of the freeway. Cause at that point I certainly need a new tire, but maybe I can, uh, avoid the new tire and the medical bills associated with the blowout on yeah. the side of the road. Yeah, yeah. So you're you're getting the car in the shop when you notice that the tires are getting a little they're starting to get a little bald and you know they need they need work soon, but if you delay any longer, it's only gonna get worse and something more dramatic might happen later if you don't take care of it. So yeah, kind of a preventative aspect to it. But Coming, overcoming that barrier to whatever stopping you from seeking out help. And I guess that at the same time too, if you kind of get, if you get a counselor involved in something earlier, I imagine it's a little bit easier to work through that to kind of build on your relationship than if you let things kind of fester for a prolonged period of time too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's kind of maybe keep on working through this a little bit. Um, I'm kind of interested Kind of pivoting away from uh, the couple aspect of this, kind of looking at looking at the individual of a man, for example. So, mm -hmm. you know, the male the male experience of infertility. We already got to hit a little bit on what that grief might look like, how it might kind of manifest itself. Um, what what sort of what sort of benefits would you say are there if you got 
uh, a guy that's processing through his grief in a proactive way, who's trying to kind of come to terms with it, uh, with the fact that maybe maybe you're not looking at having biological children. You know, why might it be? Uh, this is kind of maybe a softball sort of a question, and I don't I don't really mean it to be just an, an easy like yeah, James, absolutely, but. You know, clearly there are some hurdles to work past. Clearly there are some things to, to kind of get beyond. Um, but what, what can you expect? Like as a, as a guy, what, are, what should you be aspiring toward from a medical standpoint, uh, from a clinical standpoint, dealing with infertility? What should be my goal as a guy to live a meaningful life um, if, we're, if you're struggling through something like infertility? Yeah, I think... Well, grief grief's funny in that it's a natural process. You know, when you experience a loss, it's natural that, that you experience grief. So it's not it's not something that is strictly pathological, where you're like the absence of it is what I'm seeking. Obviously, we would all like to deal with we'd like to be able to fix the problem, and then poof, you know, you're not dealing with the loss, you're not dealing with the grief. But yeah. given that some the circumstance that sometimes couples come to the uh, ultimate conclusion of nothing that they can do about their situation, about their infertility. A lot of it then is important placing it on the kind of the meaning of the suffering, the acceptance of it in the sense that what does this loss mean to me? Why did it happen? Yeah. What is my life? Where do I find fulfillment? You know, if we're going to, if, if, if the, having children in the family is important. What does that look like for us? Do we pursue other means of having children in the sense of like adoption or fostering or investing in other children's lives? What does my life look like? And then kind of investing in that new reality where you're, you know, you're grieving the old reality, which was kind of the dream or the assumption of what the future and what your life was going to look like, but then having to adjust to a new reality. So in a way, I think the goal is to adjust to that reality if that's what it ultimately comes to, but also finding fulfillment and purpose and meaning in it as well. Kind of ultimately finding peace despite an awful suffering that no one would want to wish upon anybody else. You know, no one would want to experience. Yeah. And what do you think that it means that we suffer through these losses to begin with? Um, you know, I, as, a, as a guy, right, it's, I, I think that, I don't even need to preface it saying as a guy, just people in general, right? Uh, why do you think it is that we're kind of wired in a way um, that we want to have children, that we want to be able to experience uh, life in these ways? It seems like there's a lot of us that at least have an idea in our minds that we're uh, is it something that we feel like we're owed or is it something that you think is more deeply uh, kind of rooted within us, perhaps through, uh, through some sort of a, a theological sort of place? What, what, I think it hits on lots of things, but what are your, what are your thoughts on that as a, as a, as a clinical uh, a counselor? Well, I would say that it's a good desire to want to have children like Children are, I would argue, you know, an objective good. And I'm pretty sure the church would agree with that. But that's yeah, one of the, <laughs> that's a great desire to have, to want to have children. And that's one of the purposes that the church would say of marriage is, you know, is to create that environment for the welcoming of children. So in that sense, it's a good thing. It's a good desire to have. I mean, and granted, there could be, you know, other things at play like it's not you know in terms of the person's desire it could be complex you know there could be other complicated reasons why they may want children but ultimately that desire is good and oftentimes is a part of your identity so if you look at like the identity of like a catholic man oftentimes when a um, catholic man discerns the vocation of marriage they're looking at two identities that they're looking to take on mm -hmm. you know is the role of husband and the role of father. And so, you know, not to say that that's every couple and certainly, you know, maybe in other spheres that may not be as much of a consideration, maybe they're pursuing marriage or, you know, dating for other reasons, but 
oftentimes if you're talking about someone, a person of faith who is intentionally seeking out um, the church's understanding of marriage, then the role of fatherhood is going to be integral to that. And same for women, you know, the role of being a mother is a part of that discernment. And so there's kind of the expectation of that being a part of that vocation, a part of that life. And so then when you have that not happen, it's like a deprivation, something that's good and intended by God, but then doesn't happen in your case isn't happening in your case. So it's, it's natural to feel that kind of a loss of a role or a calling when you're like, what does that mean? I discern this calling, but it's, it's not happening, that part of it anyway. Sure. And in that instance, do you think that that experience of grief is, or do you think that the solution or the, the, the path forward to that is to find a way to substitute that desire for parenthood or is it really the point maybe more to come to grips with um, the loss and to accept the loss as a, as a way that might be um, a path to growth or, or becoming more of the, the man that God has made you to be? I think there's a level of acceptance, a dimension of acceptance, regardless of what the couple ultimately intends to do about it. I think that's a healthy part of it is to recognize that that's the reality is that you're struggling with fertility and perhaps aren't able to conceive, you know, a child biologically. And I think that's a healthy part of the grieving process is to accept that component. And that's not to say that you give up the process of trying to find you know, the medical means in terms of let's diagnose what's going on. Let's try to see if there's a, a way to conceive biologically, naturally. That's not to exclude those possibilities because that's, that's the process that, you know, you're like, is this something that uh, something we can change or mm -hmm. something we have to accept? But ultimately, if it comes to that, I think acceptance has to be a part of that. And then, you know, discern what is the reality in terms of well, how do we proceed from here? How do, what do we do about it? Do we pursue adoption? Do we pursue um, mentoring children? Or do we find some other calling, other way to pour out our lives into this? But I think that's, that's part of it, regardless of what each couple ultimately discerns in terms of how to proceed. Well, it's really interesting because I think that we are, our, our society in general is so results driven that it seems like we're, we're not very interested in trying to think about the acceptance or the entertaining even of the possibility of not getting what I want. You know, if I, if I got the money, then I should be able to go find uh, the right doctor, the right place, the right space to be able to create that which I want. And, and I mean, it's amazing what the technology is at. Uh, my, one of my best friends um, just, just finished getting through seminary, which is awesome. He was a, he was a roommate of mine at the University of Texas. Uh, and we went through again at that time, watching Vince Young go down the field. I don't have to say anything more about that at the moment. Uh, <laughs> not to just yeah, you need not. <laughs> leave that right back in there. But, um, but what, what's interesting to think about is like the medical science is just so advanced. Uh, he was taking some, some classes at uh, Catholic University of America, they had a medical ethics class and they were talking about how basically designer babies are a thing. Like they are, like they're there, you, we can do it. You, can, you want a blue eyed kid, we can get you a blue eyed kid. Um, and there are so many different ways too, even whenever, um, when, when Allie and I were looking at trying to figure out, just get a medical diagnosis or prognosis as to what our possibility was of having children. Um, you know, meeting with, meeting with, in my case, we're meeting with a urologist um, and they were going through the options that we had to try to deal with some of the infertility issues that we were dealing with. And, you know, as you listen to them, it seems like even a lot of medical professionals are very much geared in or keyed in on the idea of, okay, how do I get you the, the child that you're trying to have? Um, and these are the different ways we can do it. Boom, boom, boom. We can, you know, do in vitro. We can go and uh, try to take a look at whether there are ways to supplement hormones to make certain things happen. Uh, you know, there's uh, some different sorts of insemination issues that are possibilities that we can work with here. Um, and it seems like it's, I'm, and I've known even within my own spheres of the people that I deal with, 
um, many different men who have, you know, heard about the issues that Ali and I were having or like, oh, hey, I know some people, we can get you what you need and we can make sure that you can get to that goal of having a kid. Um, and, and what's amazing about that is that it's, uh, you know, these are some very well-intentioned people that I've been dealing with in the past with this, but they're, you know, there's a certain amount of suffering, even recognizing the loneliness of, all right, well, these people who think that the, the answer is so clear cut, um, man, look at their life. First off, one, it looks like they're happy. They, you know, had to spend tens of thousands of dollars and they had multiple tries to get through this, but they're at the other side of it and they're talking about how great it is. Man, I wish I felt that way. I wish I had that opportunity. You know, you, there's certainly even within Catholic spheres, uh, that feeling within certain individuals that, well, okay, well, maybe the church doesn't think this is the right thing to do, but if it gets me the kid, like, does that make my kid wrong? Like, uh, that's a, you know, now, I'm, now I actually am a father. This feels, this is great. This is what I wanted. Um, have you, have you encountered individuals that are dealing with, uh, well, what do you think? How do you deal with that situation? How do you deal with uh, the medical professionals that are, that are, already dialed in on the dollar signs and, and can get you what you want if you're if you're working with them or dealing with the coworkers or the the friends that are basically trying to encourage you to do something that you know the, the church doesn't stand for uh, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that well that's a difficult place to be when it seems when it's put that if you go this route you're going to get the child that you want that you've been dreaming for, that you've been hoping for, you've been praying for, but it requires means that, you know, contravene, contradict church teaching. And so, you know, that, that, that's, that could be really tempting for couples. That can be really tempting to go that route. Um, and it's and, also challenging too, because you don't yeah. generally hear priests from the pulpit being like, all right, in vitro is, a, is morally wrong. It will always be mm -hmm. morally wrong. Um, yeah. Like you don't, you don't really, there's a lot of what feels like gray out there in terms of how you interact with the system where, you know, medically we can solve the problem or, you know, scientifically mm. we can solve the problem, but there's not a lot of guidance even out there, it seems like for people to, to operate with. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I, and I, and I have concern about that kind of like selling because one, the medical professionals involved have a, have a a reason a business reason to um, promote that and two the the numbers don't say that you have 100 percent guaranteed success rate if you yes. even go that route you know and they're selling it you know, perhaps they sell that way maybe they don't maybe they're realistic but you know you're you're talking what is it 25 30 percent success rate which is you know you have a 70 percent chance that it's still not going to work for you even though you just spent tens of thousands of dollars on that and and ultimately maybe did something that you possibly don't feel comfortable with in terms of your Catholic faith. So it's just, I can see the allure there in terms of going down that route, but, you know, I think it's, and, and partially because, you know, you get to a point of desperation, like I, I just want, I want to have children and I'm willing to go at any cost to get there. But, but unfortunately, even, even that, even doing something that, you know, may, in dealing with maybe the the complications of doing something that is against your faith and maybe feeling guilty about that or something there's still no guarantee that that's even going to work so i i think it's just to be cautious to not view it as we can it's a problem that we can absolutely change and fi fix because it's it's not always there's not there's not a hundred percent um fixed rate of of with infertility so that's where I think the acceptance part comes in really important because there's some instances where it's, as much as I wish that I could just make that go away and have every couple be able to conceive if they wish, that's unfortunately not what happens. Right. Yeah. It's, it, it, it seems like you, it's where the rubber hits the road, like so quickly um, taking a look at the struggles of dealing with, infertility in that sense you really are confronted with your mortality <laughs> and, yeah. and your lack of control and and how much and goodness there's there have been so many industries that have been created on the idea that we we have some facsimile of control um yeah but yeah it's it's man those conversations are always really interesting ones and so are the conversations dealing with uh, individuals who are um 
basically who have gone down that route in the past and have worked out uh, the ability to, to have, you know, maybe they've gone down the route and they've, they've had children by um, artificial insemination or something to that effect, uh, in vitro fertilization. Uh, and, then, and then dealing with, with those, that puts people in tough positions too, trying to work your way through, all right, well, what does that mean for the the validity of of you know I've heard people say like well what you, you don't you don't agree with this is my child invalid now or like what does that mean and it's <laughs> it's like no that's not where I'm going <laughs> it's a real child it's a real situation yeah. um yeah yeah it sure creates some interesting conversations <laughs> absolutely absolutely goodness okay well let me ask you this too have you have you clinically dealt with people that have maybe uh, been trying to work their way through uh, seeking, seeking to have children by ways that the church basically says this isn't a moral good. What have you seen in interacting with people who are dealing with that? Is there, what is their path to recovery look like? Uh, and, and I guess we've already, we've, I don't want to beat a dead horse. We've been talking about the goodness of, of perhaps dealing with, dealing with loss in a way that's more from a, 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 a place of, of acceptance, but yeah, clinically, what, what, what do you see there and how can that potentially help your marriage? How can that help you grow? And, and help you grow in terms of being on the same page about what you're doing in terms of pursuing these technologies or pursuing what you're doing with your pursuit of fertility? Yeah, it's kind of a bad question the way I asked it. Here's, let me reframe it. So the question is effectively this. The church says... Uh, that there are certain things that thou shalt not do because it's it's morally wrong and it's subject it, it's subjectively wrong. Uh, so okay, I take that path. So um, that's great. We've already said what you can stand to benefit from that is accepting the fact that you're dealing with uh, loss, accepting accepting what God has given you as as a gift, uh, dealing with dealing with the finite nature of our of our mortality. So. Have you, have you seen the other side of that where you have people that are maybe uh, struggling to maybe deal with losses or perhaps, you know, they, they feel there might be, there might be an individual or a, a couple that has accepted the premise that they could go through some extraordinary means to have a kid. Does that hurt them? Uh, have you seen that as a source of hurt that maybe needs clinically to be addressed or that can be addressed to help them move along? Yeah, that can be uh, a source of um, tension and pain in in the marriage, especially if both both spouses aren't on the same page about it. Um, and especially when you talk about one of the spouses not able to contribute, if you're talking about egg donation or sperm donation, you know, it gets really complicated and there can be a lot of intense emotions and thoughts around that. And so, yeah, the big thing is, are the, are the spouses on the, even on the same page? Because if they aren't, then there's going to be some major problems with with that. So even if they verbally say they're on the same page, they may not. They may come to regret it. They may have feelings about it. They may feel it's mechanical. They may feel that it felt like it was an affair in the in the relationship. Mm. Um, there can be a lot of different dimensions there. And I know I'm going to need to wrap up here soon. But um, but yeah, there can there can be complicating factors there where um, may not have been present if you weren't if they weren't pursuing that um, technology and if they're a person of faith and it's against their church's teachings against the catholic church teaching or otherwise you have that additional factors of maybe guilt in terms of um, we went down this route and now i regret it having having done that so and you know we're secular people that might not that that might may or may not be present so sure yeah well i think this has been a really great conversation i've really appreciated your time here with us today edward uh and yeah thank you, for, thank you for sharing your medical expertise with us uh to to help us kind of look at this from some different perspectives really gratefully appreciate what you brought to the table here of course it's been a pleasure to talk with you james and yeah it's it's important work and it's a very important and dear population. So um, I, I hope that the people who listen to this, the people uh, who experience uh, the pain of infertility may experience peace, may experience wellness and support that they ultimately need to, to go through that journey.
Amen, brother. Well, and as a parting question here, is if someone was looking for counseling advice uh, within their marriage, are there any specific sorts of programs or people that they might want to look to that might help them to deal with infertility that you could point them to kind of quickly here? Um, if you're talking about couples work, um, Gottman Institute is really big. So the seven principles of making marriage work is one of the staples in couples work. Um, awesome. I think that's, I think that's huge. Um, I know there's some, there's some books about um, miscarriage and infertility. I wish I had the titles on the top of my tongue right now, but I know there's a Catholic guide, I believe, to infertility that I've seen that might be beneficial as well, but I know that there are um, those resources, but also what are your local resources in terms of counselors, in terms of, um, you know, that kind of support, support groups, you know, there may be local support groups as well. And, you know, Springs in the Desert, that's a, <laughs> a great resource as well. Thanks for the plug. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> Well, and I'll, I'll get a hold of you offline here. If you want to send me some book titles, we can make sure that we link that in the information down below. Um, okay. Edward, really appreciate your time here. Hopefully we can talk again at some point, uh, but God bless you, brother, and uh, hope, to, hope to stay in touch. That would be great. Thanks so much, James. All right. Take care. You too, sir. Bye-bye. So great getting to visit with you. Thank you for everything you've done with us today, Edward. Uh, God yeah. bless. Hope everything goes well for you. And yeah, let's let's stay in touch. Okay, that sounds great. That was great. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Have a good weekend. Oh, of course. You too. Thanks, James. Bye. Bye.